All right, in this session, we're going to go through, begin with our manuals, and uh, we're going to take you through the steps of inductive Bible study, explain it to you. But if you will look at the page that says Seminar Overview, all right, we're going to look at that first. I'm going to explain to you a little bit about where we're going in this seminar. Now, you'll notice it starts with, in the Seminar Overview, it says the written forms of the Bible. We have five different writing types in our Bible. The Bible was not written in just one particular style, but there's five different kinds of writings, which you need to understand as you study the Bible, because you're going to have to learn to study each book type differently. And so you'll notice the five that we've listed here. First, we have narratives. Narratives are written in a story form. And you will find there's lots of books. We'll show you some of the books of the Bible that are written in narrative form. But they're, they're pretty easy to understand. We just looked at one as we opened our study together. That was a narrative text. When you work with narratives, you want to learn to put yourself into the shoes of the characters, feel with them a little bit, and so forth. Uh, though, because you've got people involved that are in those kinds of writings. All right, now secondly, you have epistles. Now, epistles are very different from narratives. People are not so important in, narr in, narr in, uh, in epistles as they are in narratives. But what you're going to have is certain ideas. Uh, the writers of the epistles, especially the Apostle Paul, was our major contributor of the epistles. Paul uh, would write lots of exhortive letters. Many of his letters are just filled with exhortation. So is Peter and some of the other writers of, of the epistles. But <clears throat> they're going to give you ideas that they're going to develop. They're going to use certain words and concepts. So you have to learn how to work with epistles, which are written in a letter format. So we'll learn a little bit more about those as we go along. Thirdly, you have parables in the Bible. Now, parables are found in narrative texts primarily, but you will find that the narrative uh, is very different than the parable because the parable is a story, and it's a story that can be true to life but not necessarily a true story. Jesus would tell parables, and they would help the people to identify what he was talking about. But what he would do is he would often hide the truth from those who really didn't care to know the truth. And those that wanted to know the truth, he would explain to them in more detail about uh, what the parable meant. So a parable will have a hidden meaning to it. And that's what you have to work at to find out what is the hidden meaning there. Fourthly, you have poetry. And in Bible poetry, it's a very beautiful kind of writing. It's written in Hebrew. And you will find the, the Hebrew poets, they will, they will paint lots of pictures for you. And so you'll see there's lots of picture language. They use figurative language. So we'll talk about how to work with poetry and those kinds of writings, very different kind of writing. Fifthly, you have prophecy. And again, prophecy is very different from the other kinds of writings where the writers are going to prophesy. They're going to, they're going to speak about current issues but they're also going to predict the future. And so we'll, we'll see how you work with prophecy. And it's not nearly as complicated as many people make it. And a lot of pastors are afraid to teach prophecy because they don't understand it. And so, it, again, it's important to know how to work with this kind of text. So we have five different kinds of writings. You have narratives, epistles, you have parables, poetry, and prophecy. So there we have all five book types that are written in our Bible. Now, if you'll notice on the, on the page there, we have some arrows, and they point to outlining the main ideas from the passage. So one of the things we're going to learn in this seminar is how to outline. And it's very important to learn to outline because what you're doing in outlining is breaking the text apart into the ideas the text is saying. Now, it's very important to read through a text but once you read through it, pick up the ideas that are there. And so we're going to show you how to do that. Now, once we, you learn the outlining, then we're going to take you into what we call a charting system. And this charting system 
we're going to use to break a text apart. And as you can see in your manuals, we have a three-column chart there. And that chart is going to have three steps to it. Observation, interpretation, and application. And we're going to show you how to take a text and break it apart into little bite sizes. So what we're going to do with the chart is we're going to take every verse and we're going to break it apart into little pieces and look at those pieces to help us understand the whole picture of what the verse or verses are saying to us. Now, once we have done the charting, then what we're going to get into is how to prepare Bible studies, small group Bible studies, where we're going to ask inductive questions to, from the participants in the small group and instead of telling them what the text says, we're going to ask questions. So we're going to get into how to prepare small group Bible studies. And this is a great little study just to show you how to lead a small group. And we have quite a bit of information, which I'll talk about later, which shows you how to lead and start small group Bible studies. Then the last thing that we're going to do is primarily for pastors, and that is showing you how to prepare a sermon from your outline and chart. Those are the key ingredients that's going to lead you to teach uh, a text through what we're going to call, we call systematic Bible study, where we're going to take you through verse by verse, going through the verses, just as I did with Mark chapter 6, uh, where we went through that study there of the, uh, the feeding of the 5,000. But we go through it verse by verse, and I'm going to show you how to lay out a sermon that you can do uh, preach in that particular way. So that's that's kind of what we're doing in this seminar. We're going to cover all those different aspects. Okay, now if you'll turn to the next page, you'll see a hand here. Now in the hand, what we've done is we've taken all the books of the Bible, and this will help you to categorize the books of the Bible, but also to memorize them. So you'll notice what we've done is on the fingers, we've placed all the Old Testament books, all right? And then in between the fingers, we place the New Testament books because the New Testament comes really from the Old. And for you to really have a good understanding of the New Testament, you need to have an understanding of the Old Testament. So what we've done is on the fingers, we've placed, first of all, we place the first five books of the Old Testament, uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy. We call these books the beginning books, the books of the Pentateuch, okay? That word Pentateuch is, Penta is five and Tuch is scrolls. And of course, that's the way our Bible was originally written in a, in a scroll ma uh, format. So you have uh, your beginning books, all right, the Pentateuch books. And in these beginning books, we're of course told how God created us in Genesis and, and then how God chose Israel to be his chosen nation. Very fascinating a study as you get into how God chose Abraham and from his from his uh, background and and the person that he became and how God raised him up and and from this man came the the nation of Israel and and so we know that whole history there and it's fascinating just to to uh, get into that background of these beginning books how God uh, gave us that nation and how isn't it interesting how Israel has been the focal point of our world all these years, and how to this very day, how we're seeing how, how much the world hates Israel. And you know why? Because they're God's chosen people. And we live in a world that hates God. And they, they stand against Him. And so obviously, the nation that God chose would be most hated. So we have the beginning books there of Genesis through Deuteronomy, how God gave his law to the people and uh, uh, established them so that they would become a nation, not a nation that was just ruled by whatever they felt, but there was rules and regulations, which are so important to have in a group of people. And then every country has always followed. They've established rules and regulations. Then you have history books of the Old Testament, and these history books are are fascinating to study as you go through and you learn much about the nation of Israel and how God worked through them historically. And you'll learn lots of cultural issues. You know, for example, in the book of uh, Ruth, you find lots of cultural issues that you can, you can learn as you work through that, that book and learn about the culture of Israel. 
Then notice uh, you, you've got uh, the next uh, book types are what we call poetry books. Uh, and uh, you have uh, Job through the Song of Solomon. And so again, uh, we have some writings that are written in a poetic format, which we're going to learn how to study. Then you have the major prophets, Isaiah through Daniel. And then we have the minor prophets, Hosea through Malachi. And so we know that each of these prophets were, uh, were used by God in a very powerful way. I just happen to have the privilege of visiting uh, Nahum's tomb in Iraq uh, when I was there on my last trip uh, just a few weeks ago. And uh, uh, it was fascinating to stand at the tomb of Nahum, which is in a Jewish synagogue that's falling apart. It's, it's very old and run down. But uh, uh, Nahum was the prophet, if you recall, that uh, went to Nineveh and predicted, prophesied to Nineveh of their fall a hundred years after Jonah had been there. And you all know the story of Jonah and the whale and how God uh, brought him a reluctant prophet to come speak to Nineveh, which was a, just a brutal group of people. Well, they had forgotten the message after a hundred years. And so God raised up this prophet, Nahum, who was living in what is known now as Iraq, but it was a very tiny little village right in the foothills of the mountains. And it was fascinating to stand there and think about how God raised up this minor prophet to come and speak. And we don't know much about him other than just that he came at that time for that season. He spoke to the Ninevites, and we know that shortly after he prophesied, they were destroyed. And, uh, and so that, uh, again, the prophets are fascinating to study as you go through. I love the minor prophets. They're very, very interesting. Okay, so you have on the hand, then you have the Old Testament characters on the fingers. Then in between, we place the New Testament. And you'll notice by the beginning books of the Old, we have the beginnings of the New, the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then between the history book of the Old Testament and the, his, and the poetry books, we have the history book of the New Testament, the book of Acts, which gives us all that insight of the new covenant that we have through Christ Jesus uh, where uh, the early church came up and was developed. And then you'll notice we have the writings of the epistles. And again, these are very important writings that give us those insights into the new covenant that we have through Christ. And then we have our one prophecy book in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, which gives us some exciting insights into the last days which we are living. And truly, uh, you can just see uh, how God's Word is so accurate from Genesis to Revelation. It's, it's accurate. The prophecies that were given so long before they, these events would happen are coming true, and we are getting to see some of these very things that we're living in. I believe we're living in the very last of the last days. Jesus is coming back soon. But God has spoken in this book here. And he's revealed to us truths that we need to understand. And if we will get into the book and understand that this is God's holy word. This is not just a, a good book, but it's a holy book. The Apostle Paul tells us that this book is inspired of God. This is the inspired word of God. It's God-breathed. And when you get into this book... Paul tells us all Scripture is inspired of God. That word inspired means God breathed. And what God did is He breathed life into this book. And as you get into this book, it will breathe life into you. And as you study this book, then it's going to breathe life through you to other people. But I tell you folks, this is a holy, holy book. We are not to take it lightly. God has spoken here. We have many teachers around the world today that are telling you that this book has some errors in it. There are some flaws here. Now, I will admit that there are some translations that are not very good. For example, the Jehovah's Witnesses have a translation that is very poorly done because they made it say 
what they wanted to say. They took it away from the, what the original manuscripts would say, and they made interpretations that the text is not saying. But if you get into this book and some of those original manuscripts that were given to us, and then the copies were made of those, and, and we know that they're reliable, and we know that this book is not filled with errors, as many want, to, want you to believe. When I was over in, uh, in uh, New Zealand doing a seminar over there, I was asked to come to a studio and do an interview. And they were talking about, the, is God's word uh, inspired or is there errors, you know, in God's word? Well, uh, we, uh, they were interviewing a Catholic priest who was a scholar from the Catholic circles and then they uh, interviewed me after they ca- interviewed him. Well, when they asked the Catholic priest, is, is, the, is there errors in the Bible? He said, oh yeah, there's lots of errors. And he went on to talk about how men are, you know, make errors and because we're human beings and so there's going to be some errors in it and so forth. He went back and forth, you know, and he felt like the Bible, there's lots of uh, flaws in the Bible. Well, when they asked me the same question, I said, well, I don't believe there's one error in the Bible. I think God is very capable of working through flawed men. He's been doing it for a long time, and he can say what he wants to say and say it without error. And I believe that God has given us a book that is without error. And we can, what, what he said in here, we can trust is the truth. And we can uh, know that it's reliable. It's not filled with mistakes uh, that many want us to believe is uh, is happening with our Bible. So we have to take this book and we have to, you know, improve it a little bit because because it doesn't say it. You know, it's kind of old and it's not current. And, and, and folks, I want to tell you something. When you get into this book and you begin to study it and, and you really begin to hear from God, you realize it is so relevant. It's so alive. It's so rich. And those that want to tell you that the Bible needs a little help, folks, it doesn't need any help at all. Those pastors that are saying that need a lot of help. They need to get into the book. And so what we have is 39 Old Testament books, 22 New Testament, uh, 27 New Testament books for a total of 66 books in our Bible. It was written over a period of about 1,600 years. There's somewhere between 35 and 40 authors. We're not quite sure who wrote some of the books of our Bible. But these books were written by men who came from all different walks of life. Some of them were highly educated, brilliant men like the Apostle Paul, highly educated, incredible scholar. And some of the men that wrote the Bible, like King Saul, Solomon, you know, I mean, brilliant. And then you have other men like Peter who was just a common fisherman, uneducated and untrained according to uh, the Sanhedrin that brought Peter before, Peter and John before them. They recognized them as untrained. Well, I'm sure they had some training. They grew up in the synagogue and were taught, you know, uh, from from, uh, the, the Torah and so forth, but but uh, they, they, they weren't educated like the Apostle Paul was under some of the finest scholars. But you will find that men from all these different walks of life were involved in writing the scriptures, like Peter and James and John. And that what they wrote was inspired of God. It was men moved of the Holy Spirit, and that's how we got our Bible today. And so uh, uh, we have a, an incredible book. This is the Holy Word of God. And God has spoken powerfully through it. And therefore, you and I, we need to know what has God said. And it's your responsibility, it's my responsibility to be a student of the Word. That I would learn how to study it. And so this system that we're going to get you into is going to really help you to learn how to study this book that God has given to us. Now, if you'll also notice while I got the hand up, you'll see the book types here, okay? Okay. So if you look at the first, the thumb, uh, the books of the Pentateuch, okay, the Gospels, the history books of the Old Testament, and the one history book in the New Testament, we have 22 books in our Bible that are written in narrative form, story form. 
All right? Then you have five poetry books. There's another book type. Then you'll notice we have 21 epistles. That's another book type. All right? And then we have the prophetic books, the major prophets and the minor prophets. And by the way, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people ask, what's the difference between the majors and the minors? The difference between the majors and the minors in our Bible is that the majors are larger portions of, of prophecy that were written. The minor prophets are smaller writings. You'll say, like Nahum, for example, Malachi, they're just really short little uh, prophetic books. Very little bit, little bit of information is given in those short little writings there. Where Isaiah, for example, has 66 chapters. And so, you know, there's just a lot more information there. Okay, so there you have uh, four of the book types. You have the majors and the minors, okay? And then what we didn't touch on was the one book type called parables. And what you're going to find as you study your Bible is you'll find parables scattered throughout your Bible. Now, a lot of them are in the Gospels. But you will find parables scattered throughout the entire Bible. And so, uh, again, there's your five different kinds of writings on the hand. Everybody see that now? Okay. All right. So this book that God has given to us, we are so blessed to, to have it and God wants us to be men and women who get into this book so how do we study it how do we get into this book it's always been a question well uh, what you have to do is you have to learn to take your text and you have to learn how to break it apart now most of us here aren't going to learn Greek and Hebrew that's what our Bible is written in the Greek and the Hebrew and so if you don't know the Greek or the Hebrew, how in the world are you going to be able to interpret the Bible? Well, you need a good translation. And so if you have a good translation, now I'm using a lot from the New King James Version. It's a very reliable version taken from that original, some of the original manuscripts. Uh, the King James, of course, came out from one of those original manuscripts that were very clear and effective, and then eventually uh, the, it translated into the New King James Version. You have a number of uh, good, reliable translations. I'll get into them a little bit more with you later, but, but uh, how do you get into this study? So there are different methods of Bible study that are used today. Three of the most commonly are written down on the page right across from your hand there, talking about inductive deductive, and springboarding. These are the methods that are widely used today. Now, unfortunately, two of them are not very good. The inductive method is, is your safest way to study because it's going to work with what the text says. So that word inductive, if you'll notice, I mentioned this before, induct is to pull out, all right? And, and then I'm pulling out from the text the facts. Now, we have uh, halls of fame today that people are inducted into. Now, how is somebody inducted into a hall of fame? Well, there has to be certain facts about them to be inducted into that hall of fame. They have to have accomplished certain things. Now, I was a really good athlete, and I played uh, college football and high school football, of course, and I played basketball, baseball, but uh, I actually recently was inducted to, into a high, my high school Hall of Fame. And uh, the reason I was inducted was because I've accomplished some certain facts. Now, like there's a professional Hall of Fame I was at recently. Uh, it's a, it was fascinating to be there because all these football players were amazing football players. And one of them that I was standing looking at is this picture. They got a bust of these Hall of Famers in the... Uh, uh, Canton, Ohio Hall of Fame. And uh, I was looking at this one, John Elway. He was a quarterback for the Denver Broncos. Now, he was inducted into the Hall of Fame along with several hundred other men that are in this Hall of Fame. Well, he, he, he didn't get in there because somebody said, you know, I think that guy was a good quarterback. Yeah, I th he threw a few touchdown passes. 
Well, the only reason John Elway was inducted into the Hall of Fame was he accomplished certain facts. Certain things that he did established him to be taken into the Hall of Fame. That's how somebody gets there. And so it's pulling out from everybody else certain details that are there in the text. And so that's what we're doing. We're pulling out from the text. We're inducting uh, facts of the text. We don't work with speculation in inductive Bible study. We just simply work with what the text says. All right, now, I'll get into it a lot more with you in a minute, but there, the second method mentioned there is deductive Bible study. Now, unfortunately, it's not a real safe way to study because in inductive Bible stu- in deductive Bible study, you always start with a certain premise, a certain idea. And then you move from your idea to the Bible to prove that idea. But did you know that you can make this book say anything you want it to say? I can, in fact, did you know I could teach uh, uh, atheism from the Bible? Did you know that the Bible says there is no God? Did you know the Bible says that? It does. Psalm 14, 1. Psalm 53, 1. It says, there is no God. Now, what you're going to notice is I did something here to pull this out of the text here. I pulled it out of those verses where it says there is no God. But in Psalm 14, 1 and Psalm 53, 1, they both say the same thing. The fool has said in their heart, there is no God. So do you see what I just did? I took a little phrase, I isolated it, all right? And it says something before it, and it says something after it. Do you see the context there is very important? Because uh, I took this little phrase out of a context. And what people do today, they do this all the time. Pastors do this all the time. They will take a little portion of Scripture from here, another portion from over here, and they are going to write a, or develop a theology from little verses here, little verses there. And what you will find is so often they will take them out of their context. And and so we find today there are many teachings that go on that are, False teachings because they were taken out of their context. Because there is a God, isn't there? And I'm so glad there is a God. But there's many today that want you to believe that there, you know, everything just happened by chance. And it takes a lot more faith to believe that than it does the fact is when you begin to study the world we live in, you realize it just couldn't happen by accident but God designed it all and God is behind it all but uh, there's one other method that is mentioned here in our in our manual and that's what we call the springboard method now the springboard method is is a, 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 a kind of study where the teacher will take a verse in scripture or several verses And then they will jump out of the text and just talk about whatever they want to talk about. They never really explain what those verses mean. They just use them because it inspires them to talk about whatever they want to talk about. And so you will have men today, and it happens every Sunday, and you can watch some of them on television. There's some really good ones on television that do this. They springboard all over the Bible. They just jump into a text, they jump out, and they're all over the Bible. And many, many times what they do is they're taking it out of their context. And the result is what they're teaching is not true teachings from God's Word. But uh, the springboard, it's like, in some countries, uh, they they don't have that word, so they use uh, the word trampoline. In most countries, that word communicates pretty clearly. But you know what a trampoline is. Now, I've got one in my backyard. Uh, and uh, 
I have 10 grandchildren, all right? We had three children, and uh, actually, we, we ended up with fourth. We adopted a fourth, and I'm going to tell you a story about them later on. But uh, uh, our kids produced for us 10 grandchildren, and we're not sure they're done yet. We're, we hope there's a few more coming still, but anyway... Uh, these uh, these ten grandkids now they're growing up and I'll have five or six of them over at my house a given time, and they'll get on that trampoline and they're going to jump up and down all together and they love to do that all together all six of them you know or seven of them at one time and and we have a net around it and that net is a security net because if we didn't have that what would happen sooner or later with six of them jumping on it somebody's going to go flying off. And they'd get hurt, you see. But that net protects them. Well, unfortunately, we have a lot of teachers today that do not have a security net around this book. And what they do is they jump out of it all the time. And as they jump out of it, what they begin to do is they just start sharing their thoughts and their philosophies and their ideas. And it really has nothing to do with the text. And you see, you'll never learn God's thoughts by a springboard teaching. You just pay attention now to some of these television guys. And worry what they're doing is they're just springboarding. They're just, they'll they'll have a Bible up. And folks, I tell you what, there's one of the biggest deceptions going on in the church today, right now, where you got a pastor holding up the book. And it looks really good. But if you will watch what, and listen to what comes out of his mouth and the words that come out of his mouth and the things that he's talking about, it will not match up with what the Word of God says. And so the deception is people think, oh man, this guy's really good. You know? And there's some very inspiring guys that are on television and that will be in some of our churches today around the world. These guys are very inspirational. But if you look carefully, And listen carefully to what they're saying. You'll find out what they're really saying is not found in this book. And so what we teach is critical. We must teach what God has said, not what man is saying. In a lot of churches today, we see that they're really developing the pastor. All he's doing is developing his own kingdom. And God has not called us to develop our own kingdom. We're here to build the kingdom of God. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And so, as we study the Word of God, the safest way to study it is not the springboard method and not the deductive method. The deductive method is not always bad because if you have the correct idea, then then you can uh, you can pull certain things out of the scriptures and it, it it will match what you're saying and it's accurate. But In many situations, it can be very dangerous. So the safest way to study the Word is inducted because I'm not going to guess what the text says. So if you will turn your your manual to the next page, you'll find that uh, we have three steps for inductive Bible study here now. So we want to get into what is is inductive Bible study. Well, uh, when we go to study, our first step is we must be observers. We must read the text carefully. What does the text say? So to understand what it says, obviously I'm going to have to read it and reread it. I want to write down my first impressions. Okay, it's great to have a pencil. I I love pencils and erasers, you know, because I can write things down and I can erase it if I'm inaccurate in what I'm, I'm, I'm putting down. And then I'm going to ask questions like who, what, when, where, how. These are great questions of observation, especially working with narrative text. And so I'm going to uh, find out what the facts are by just reading and rereading the text. It's very important to learn to be a good observer. Now, I had a, 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 something happen to me years ago when I was in college. Uh, I ended up, uh, because I was a good athlete, I ended up getting a scholarship to out of uh, shortly, I went to high school first, and then I went to a junior college for a year and a half. And after a year and a half, I got a full scholarship to a big university to play football. And I was not a very good student. I, I just struggled with school, but 
you know, I, to, in order to play football, you got to get the passing grades, you know. So, so I was just barely passing. And anyway, I, I, when I'm at this big university, I love the football, but I hated the classroom. And, and this one particular class I really disliked, it, it was called zoology. And in this particular class, you know, where you're looking at different, uh, like we had frogs one day and we were looking at fish and different kind of uh, uh, examples like that. You know, I, I'm look, uh, we, uh, we came into the class and the professor said, today we're going to study the frog. Doesn't that sound exciting? You know, and he said, now every one of you I have a frog for. And so he pulled out a formaldehyde and put into a tray a frog for every one of us in the class. He says, now what we're going to do today is we're going to observe the frog. And I want you to take your frog, and I want you to look at it. I want you to keep looking at it. I want you to write down all your observations. And so being the kind of student that I was, I looked at my frog for about 10 minutes. And I kept looking at it, you know, and, and I was writing down everything I could see. And after about 10 minutes, I couldn't see anything more. And so I thought, you know, this is kind of great. This is a three-hour lab, by the way. Uh, and so I'm thinking, this is great. I, he's asked me to observe it. I've done my observation, and I'm done. So I wrote down my, you know, had all my observations down, and I walked up to my professor, and I said, I'm done. And I handed him my paper, and he goes, wait a second. And he started reading my paper. And as he's reading the paper, his head's just kind of going like this. He says, son, you haven't seen anything yet. You need to go back and look some more. And I thought to myself, well, good grief. I looked for 10 minutes, you know, what else could I see? You know, so anyway, I ended up going back to my desk and I pulled out my frog again and I'm looking at it and I kept looking at it and I kept looking at it. And sure enough, I, find, I, I saw a couple more things that I hadn't seen the first time. And so I wrote them down and I thought, this has got to be it. And so I walked back up to him and said, well, hey, I found, you know, a couple more things here. And so, you know, he's looking at my paper and again, his head is just going like this. And he goes, son, you're missing the most obvious characteristics of the frog. You need to go back and look some more. Well, I couldn't believe this. You know, what's the most obvious things? I mean, I'd looked and looked at the frog, and I'm missing the most obvious things. So I go back, and I'm looking at this frog. And now, boy, I tell you what, I am really looking at this frog. And for the next three hours, I looked at this frog. And you know what? The longer I looked at the frog the more I began to see. And at the end of my three-hour laboratory class, I walked up to my professor and handed him my paper, and he stopped me again. And he started reading my paper. And this time his head was going like this. He says, good, you're beginning to observe. But you need to understand something. There's still a lot more to see here. And that guy taught me some incredible lessons about careful observation. Because I wasn't a very good observer. And he was teaching me how to look at something. And, and it wasn't all that much later. Uh, I, you know, I finished up my football career, uh, and I didn't get called to the NFL. I was hoping to go play football in the professional ranks, but I, I never got the call. So I, I go, what am I going to do? Well, I decided to go to Bible school. And so I, you know, I was at a Bible school for about a year, and... I'll never forget one night I was looking at a text and I was studying it and I just started complaining. I'm sure you've never done that before, but I, I really was tired of my studies and I was complaining to the Lord, Lord, this is so hard and uh, so forth. And I'll never forget, I, I, I heard this little voice and it wasn't an audible voice. I've never heard an audible voice of the Lord. I wish he would talk to me sometimes like that. But I heard this little voice and I really knew it was the Lord speaking to me. And this voice said, you study my word like you did the frog in zoology for the first 10 minutes and you expect to understand what I'm saying. And I knew what the Lord was saying to me. And I had to repent. <laughs> but I knew that I, if I'm going to be a student of God's word, I've got to be a good observer. And that professor in zoology had taught me how to look at something. And the Lord said, there, that, use that. Use what you've learned there because it's going to help you as you study your Bible. Look and keep looking because the more you look, the more you're going to see. 
And so I learned the important lesson of careful observation. You've got to observe details very carefully. Now, there was a very famous uh, medical professor, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this cup here. Can I borrow your cup right here a second? Uh, this medical professor was teaching these students who are soon to become doctors the important lessons of careful observation. And so he held up this jar, and he says, now, students, in this jar is a disease. And it's possible for you to determine what the disease is by putting your finger into the jar and into your mouth. And so the professor did exactly that. He put his finger into the jar and went into his mouth. And then he passed it to the first students. And their face kind of turned white thinking, there's a disease in there and he wants me to put my finger into it and then into my mouth. And slowly but surely, he got every student in his class to put their finger into the jar and into their mouth. Well, the jar came back to him. He held it up and he says, now students, I want you to understand what I said about careful observation. Because if you had have carefully observed me, you would observe that this first, my index finger, went into the jar, but my middle finger actually went into my mouth. And this professor was teaching these students a very important lesson because as doctors, they have to be good observers. And they have to learn to ask the right questions. And they have to learn to look and keep looking because as they begin to look, they're going to begin to see things that are going to lead to an interpretation and then an application. But if you don't observe well, it can cost you your life in the medical profession. And so you see, it's true also, as a student of God's Word, you must learn to be a good observer to get the details. Because as you learn to get the details, then it's going to lead you to correctly bring interpretation and application. But first, you got to get the facts. That's the first step. Now we're going to move to interpretation. Now, it's very important to follow these steps. We don't just read something and try to make an application, but we want to understand what does it mean. So, to find out what it means, I have to now follow some rules. We call these rules of hermeneutics. All right? Hermeneutics is the science of interpreting Scripture. How do we interpret Scripture? Well, there are some rules that you must follow if you're going to interpret correctly. All right? And I've got four important rules. There's more than this, but these are four key rules as we interpret Scripture. Number one, I believe we're to interpret literally. Most of Scripture, notice I said most, not all, but most of Scripture, you can interpret it literally. What it says is what it means. You want to look for that plain and simple meaning. And so I'm going to interpret most of Scripture literally. However, there are some texts, when you get into Hebrew poetry, for example, they use figurative language. They're going to paint pictures for you. And so what I have to do there is understand what is the picture, what's the figure pointing to, and it's common sense will frequently lead you to find an understanding. It's not that difficult, but there's a certain picture. It's painting it for you, and we're going to see that as we work with a, a poetry text later on, how that, that figurative language helps you to get the idea, all right, of what he's talking about. But most of Scripture, again, what it says is what it means. Even when you work with Bible prophecy, until you come to the symbols that they speak about, when they speak about a symbol, then obviously you can't interpret that literally, but there is going to be a literal fulfillment of that symbol in history later on. And we know that many of those have been fulfilled already. But uh, a lot of Bible prophecy, what the prophet said is exactly, you can interpret exactly literally. You know, what it says is what it means. So when the prophet said, I'm going to bring judgment upon the land, that's exactly what God meant and you can interpret it literally, all right? So, again, we interpret literally unless the text is 
clearly moving us in a different idea there. All right. Secondly, we're going to study in context. Now, again, I'll take you back to what I wrote down here on the board. I said there is no God. Well, I took it out of its context. I took it out of that verse and just isolated this little part. You cannot do that with Scripture. You cannot just isolate one little part. You have to look at the whole context. Look what's written before and what's written after. All right? And then when I'm not clear, then I'm going to move to my third step. Okay? If the context isn't clear, then I'm going to let Scripture interpret Scripture. So now I'm going to cross-reference a little bit. I'm going to look at other Scriptures. And again, the more you study Scripture, the more you're going to interpret correctly. But you have to allow the Scriptures to interpret themselves. The Bible is a very good interpreter of itself. It really doesn't need your help. So let it interpret itself. And if you stay in the context, in most situations, just like this one here, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Well, the context is going to explain it for you. So you stay in it. All right? I'm going to erase this because we know that that is not true. All right? But stay in the context. As long as possible, work with that immediate context. And then from there, I'm going to move to other scriptures to help me to interpret what he's really talking about. Now, a lot of people, and we'll say this early in the seminar, a lot of people, the minute they read something and they don't understand it in the context, the first thing they do is turn to a commentary. And I want to tell you something. Don't do that. Now, there's nothing wrong with commentaries, but we use commentaries at the end of our inductive study, not at the beginning. Because I want to work with what the text says first. And, and, and so once it, I understand it, then I'm going to move on. And, and uh, if I don't understand something, I'm going to mark it, and I'll come back to it, look up in a commentary or so forth that, that I trust. Fourthly, the New Testament takes precedence. And that just simply means there are some things that the Old Testament teaches that we're not following any longer because of the new covenant that we have through Christ. So thank God, for example, when you, uh, anybody here not sinned today? <laughs> uh, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, even today, you know, because we're sinners. So we need forgiveness. Well, did you bring your lamb or your goat? Or <laughs> did you bring a sacrifice? No. See, we don't have to do that anymore because of the wonderful covenant of Christ Jesus. Thank God that God sent Jesus to die on the cross. So again, uh, we, we're, we're going to let the New Testament take precedence over some of the things that the Old Testament says. Does that mean the Old Testament is not relevant anymore? We don't study anymore? No. It's very important. And so we need to study both the Old and the New. But there's going to be some things the New Testament will overrule what the Old Testament was teaching. I love what uh, Dr. David Cooper, we've written down here in your manual, the, his golden rule of interpretation. It says, when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. And you're going to find common sense is a very important rule to follow in your interpretation of Scripture. Therefore, take every word at its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning, unless the facts of the immediate context studied in the light of the related passages and the fundamental truths indicate clearly otherwise. And so again, common sense is going to help you as you work with Scripture and, uh, and draw your interpretations, all right? Always interpret from the laws of grammar and the facts of history. We're going to use those as we work with the text in following the grammar, and I'm going to show you how to do that as we get into uh, charting and bringing the text apart. Now, you'll notice on uh, page, on the, the following pages, we have some more information dealing with interpretation and you'll see how we, we talk about several different things. And I just want to encourage you to make sure you work through that information because I'm not going to take time in the seminar to go through this. But uh, we want to be very careful. For example, point number one, interpret your, ex, uh, your experience by the Scriptures. Do not interpret the Scriptures by your experience. You know, so we're not going to uh, yeah, interpret my experience you know, I'm not going to take my, my experience and say, okay, well, how does this fit with the Scriptures? But does it line up with what God says? 
And if it says the same thing, then I can, I can use that. But you want to be very, very careful not to misinterpret the scriptures by just your experience. We get a lot of people that will use their experience over the word of God. And you cannot do that. Uh, and so you've got a lot of information here about uh, how to be careful about not being dogmatic about scripture, uh, how to determine uh, when a passage is figurative or literal. It's very important. And uh, uh, be very careful about not rationalizing Scripture. And then lastly, it talks about don't spiritualize the Scriptures. It's really easy to over-spiritualize the Scriptures. And you don't want to do that. Okay? So our first step in inductive Bible study is observation. The second step is interpretation. And then you'll notice the next page there is application after the information on interpretation there. How should I respond? Are there examples to follow? Are there sins to forsake? Are there errors to avoid? Promises to believe? Commands to obey? Action to take? What, in other words, what am I going to do about it? So every time I study the Scripture, I want to bring application. Now, it's important to look in the context and understand how the people that were getting that particular message, you know, how they would, inter- uh, how they would apply it to their lives. And so I want to do that. I want to look at it as much as I can. But ultimately, it's going to come down to me. What is God saying to me personally? And I want to apply that to our lives. Now, our applications are all going to vary. It's not going to be the same for each one of us. So, so uh, again, we want to appeal to the Holy Spirit to help us to apply these truths to our lives. What are some examples that I need to follow? Sins to forsake, errors to avoid, promise to believe, commands to obey. Actually, what am I going to do? about what God has said. And so application is critical. We have gone through the three steps uh, of of, uh, inductive Bible study. So now, you know, just to to put it all together, again, the first step in inductive Bible study is observation. Get the facts. The second step is interpretation. Explain the meaning. Work with the context. And then the third step is now I'm going to apply it. That's what inductive Bible study is all about. It, you must first observe, then you must interpret and apply. And you're going to find it's a very effective way to study the Scriptures. And I believe it's, it's a means in which God wants us to learn more about Him. And so this is the inductive Bible study system, and I hope everybody has got the idea now.